Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Faye Liberty Nichols, Associate Research Curator in Modern and Contemporary Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture, uh, which is given in conjunction with the exhibition Christina Ramberg, A Retrospective, that's on view in the Abbott Galleries in the Modern Wing. And I just want to say that today is the opening of four Chicago artists. Theodore Halkin, Evelyn Statzinger, Barbara Rossi, and Christina Ramberg, um, adjacent to the auditorium in the Prints and Drawings galleries, if you have a chance or you haven't seen it already. Um, before we begin, a reminder to please silence mobile phones and devices. Um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's program, Riva Lehrer. Um, Riva Lehrer was a catalog essayist for the Ramberg Exhibition Catalog, um, and Riva is an artist, writer, and curator who focuses on the socially challenged body, including aspects of disability, queerness, and gender. Her visual art has been exhibited in venues including the National Portrait Gallery of the Smithsonian Institution and the National Museum of Women in the Arts, both in Washington, D.C., and the Yale University Art Gallery, New Haven, Connecticut, among others. Her recent memoir, Gollum Girl, was published in October 2020 and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Lara was a longtime faculty member at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and she currently serves as an instructor in the Department of Medical Humanities and Bioethics at Northwestern University. Um, I could go on. But I want to save the most time for Riva. We're so pleased to have her here, and we're so fortunate to hear from her. Uh, so, with further, without further delay, welcome me and join, uh, join me in welcoming <laughs> Riva. Try not to dislodge my mic. That's so I'll send good waves of energy to this little wire thing that I don't end up sending it flying. And the uh, switch to the reading glasses means I can't see anybody. So if you have stage fright, I highly recommend myopia. Um, OK, let's see if we can do this. All right. I still don't understand it. There I was, a painting student at SAIC, right when Christina Ramberg was chair of painting and drawing, and yet we never met. True, I was one solipsistic mess in a way that only an art student can be. <laughs> and so that must have been why I failed to notice a six foot one brunette striding the halls. Possibly she noticed me. I am, I'm told, a little unusual. If we had met, we might have discovered that we had things in common. For instance, that we both had problems finding clothes and that neither of us could wear fashionable shoes. But above all, that we dealt with being stared at. Ramberg sewed her own garments for the same reasons that my mother created her wardrobe. Mom was a fat woman with a great sense of style. And mom also sewed my dresses all the way through my childhood because the fashion industry pretends that bodies like ours do not exist. Christina Ramberg was born in 1946. Her teenage years bridged the late 50s through the 60s, during which she grew to a height of six foot one, which made her remarkable because consider that at the time, even fashion models were not especially tall. Twiggy, famous Twiggy, was 5'6", and Lauren Hutton was all of 5'7". Supermodels and ba female basketball players didn't come into vogue until the pretty late 70s, which meant that there were damn few categories for tall women, except possibly as freak. Let me be clear, I am not saying that Christina Ramberg was a freak. I am referring to the time in which she lived, which had such dreadful restrictions around what a woman could be. Friends of hers have told me that she did experience being gawked at and was the target of inappropriate comments, something I'm very familiar with. 
I spoke with the artist Elizabeth Riggle, who worked for Ramberg, and she said that Christina would get this sort of stricken look on her face when people commented on her height. I'm told, though, that she'd laugh off the stairs and the barbs and even joke that she bought her shoes at the same shops as cross-dressing men. And she drew these fantasias of pretty shoes, and I so get that. I've worn these um, orthopedic boots since kindergarten. So shoe stores are kind of like uh, the most useless places on earth for me. Um, when you're unusual, your body becomes a spectacle. It's judged as a collection of acceptable and rejected parts. You're fractured into two entities, the lived subjective self that you know and the self that's mirrored back to you by others. Often you cease to be legible either to the outside world or to yourself. And this is bodily incoherence. Right from the beginning, Rambert explored the split self the double consciousness that haunts female identity. This talk is about embodiment. I will be referring to Rambrick's history, but I'm not attempting to reduce her work to mere biography, as happens far too often to female artists. I call it the Frida Kahlo effect. Rambrick's works are never straightforward autobiographies, and nothing can overshadow the power of her formal brilliance. One of the first exhibits in our show is Hair, an installation of her SAIC senior exhibition in spring of 68. Elaborate hairstyles set in this sort of glowing gray-green space. Manicured hands cup the curls and part the waves. Hands the peachy plastic color of dolls depicted in the style of romance and adventure comic books, comics that, by the way, reinforce the conventions of gender. These hands stand in for the viewer. They invite us to possess these women. They're impresarios eager to display the carnival sideshow of hair. And what a sideshow it is. This hair is violating physics. Flowing locks cascade in one direction only to change rhythm, defy gravity, collide, as if all the hairstyles of the 40s and 50s are collaging themselves haphazardly over these heads. I'm trying not to lose my little stay, stay lassie. Uh-oh, did I? No, I'm still there. And the pointer, it says in my notes, use pointer. <laughs> Let's look again at those hands. There's something really peculiar going on here. At first glance, the hands seemed to belong to the women on display, but look, here and here and here. These hands only make sense if they belong to somebody else, some other unseen woman, an entity in control of the heads. There's no way that you could get your wrist to do some of these positions. And so we see very subtly that Ramberg has severed the self in two, her first foray into body horror. Are the hands policing the heads, just as mothers and grandmothers have been expected to mold each generation into female compliance? Or are they animating the women, the, animating the animal in the women? Or what if the hands are, in fact, the subject's own, and she's so detached from her own body, she's acting as if she's the warden and treating herself like an object. I think this is a central question in Ramberg's narratives. Are her figures, whether female or ambiguously gendered, performing of their own volition, or are they being coerced into becoming, dis on, into becoming displays? I can't help but think of and I didn't know that the official name of this uh, entity is Thing T Thing from the Adams Family. It's a benign monster, a literal hand servant, yet tales of murderous severed hands predate the 18th century, such as the dead but malevolent hand of glory made from a corpse. 
Those hands, though, they're lyrical. They're boneless, graceful as swan's necks, rising from creamy, full-bellied palms that curve like a woman's cheek, wrists like columnar necks. What I actually see are images of the full, nude, autonomous female body, engaged in what I can only call material flirtation, as if these are upright odalisques. These hands possess volition, which is not true of all of Ramberg's figures. They're playing with scraps of fabric. They twist around the fingers, pinch it against thumbs, shroud the fingers like a glove. Red tipped nails heighten our tactile imagination. Bound hand sums up the ambiguity of Ramberg's figures. The fingers are lightly caught underneath straps of hair, easily freed, yet submitting to faux control. I followed the theme of volitional ambiguity all the way through the turns of Ramberg's work, and the enigmas seem to multiply. Even her color palette is built on mystery. The hues a little dimmed, the figures a little distant from the viewer, a fog that pulls us in closer and we lean in. At last, I saw through the shadows and what I saw were monsters. What do I mean by monsters? I'm not saying that Ramberg painted monsters in the conventional sense. There are no jump scares here. What Ramberg did do was to render the body unfamiliar as Jeffrey Cohen said in the opening slide when he first came in, monsters are born at fragmentation. Her figures are caught between categories. Monsters exist between the male and female, the human and robot, the person and the beast. The etymology of the word monster is from the Latin monstrum, an open, bleh, an omen or a revelation and monere, to warn. The academic field of monster theory posits that cultures use monsters in order to illuminate social conflict or confusion. When a society reaches a point of anxiety and confusion, it, it invents monsters. We make creatures that illuminate, then violate the borders of accepted reality. They blur our accepted categories, human animal, mechanical corporeal, alive dead, earthly alien. All monsters are new creatures that weld together unmatching classifications. The monster body then is illegible. It disorients our understanding of reality. By doing so, it shows us where the boundaries lie. The questions that monsters pose always need asking. The most famous ruptured body may be Frankenstein's monster, or also called the creature, in which life and death are simultaneously present. In one of my favorite films ever, the 1935 Bride of Frankenstein, the creature's scars show us how he was constructed. But the bride's scars are limited to a little pair under her chin where her head was sewn onto her neck. All else is hidden under bandages and gown. She may be dead, but damn, we want her sexy. <laughs> it takes so little to be seen as a monster, a blemish, a missing or wayward body. And here comes the fear, the pity, the disgust. The disabled body has been seen as monstrous for century upon century, monster and cripple, have been nearly synonymous. I know this because I am a monster. I was born in 1958, and for my entire life, I've been told by doctors, by strangers, by the well-meaning, that I'm an error of nature. My memoir, which I just happen to have right here. <laughs> I should be ashamed. Here it is. <laughs> um, Golem Girl describes my life as a monster, and it delineates the scars that I share with the bride. There is power, 
Perhaps this is why Ramberg could see the apparatus of gender so clearly. Every monster is a product of a specific time period, a cultural moment. In our own moment, the transgender body is being called a monster. Forces of hate and fear claim that trans people are not human and are actively trying to erase their existence. Ramberg's early work draws from her mother's time, the 1940s and 50s, the post-war period in which women were supposed to resubmit to powerlessness. And yet Christina's own time was the 60s and 70s, when sexual liberation and feminism were fueled by rage against the war and the fire of civil rights. The young felt a wild prerogative to critique everything their parents held dear. The traditional role of the female body was to be observed, judged, and robbed of autonomy. Ramberg shows us women obser observing themselves, being observed, as women also observe each other, all under the demanding patriarchal gaze. This is ironic, all this gazing, because Ramberg never shows us anyone's eyes. Come to that, she doesn't really show us faces either. So really look at this. Almost always in figuration, the face is the emotional engine of the image. But for Ramberg, the faces are miss missing, withheld, or muted. The women, their mouths subsumed into the demands of femininity. So the female cannot speak directly. Without the face, the body must tell all. As boys mature, their bodies elongate, become muscular, but the silhouette remains basically rectilinear, shoulders wider than the hips. For pubescent girls, it's different. Their bodies de develop dramatic protuberances, even before the advent of pregnancy. Men's clothing emphasizes orthogonal lines. Business suits <clears throat> conceal vulnerability, and suppress individuality. Suits make the male body appear whole and contiguous. Women's clothing, though, that's a different deal. It divides the body into sections. It guides the eye away from the bad qualities and towards the good qualities. In Bell Rev and Pearl Rainbow, Ramberg divides the female body into three discrete segments. Each is placed in a separate frame. It's Ramberg as painter, as surgeon, slicing and suturing as she goes. Her painting technique employs these tiny marks, much like the stitches she uses in her fabric work later. Her triptychs are often installed in different order, which really reminds me of the magician's trick of sawing a lady into pieces and then rearranging her parts for maximum horror. In all these cases, woman becomes a collection of fetishized parts. In oh, I think, are we on the right slide? We'll see. Um, sorry, y'all. Uh, fetishized parts uh, invoking such phrases as, I'm an ass man, or I'm a tit man. To become a fetish, that's so beautiful. Um, to become a fetish is to be both inside and outside of oneself, desired but robbed of individuality, an object. Commentary around Ramberg often focuses almost entirely on, uh, I think, let's go back to that last slide. Thank you. Um, it's, you know, machinery has its own sort of impulses. Um, commentary around Ramberg's work often focuses on her erotic sensibility, yet her constructions of desire are hardly straightforward. Monster theory tells us that for monsters, desire is taboo. I could speak on that for about the next three hours, but I'm sure you guys have some place to be. 
But if a creature wants sex or love, it's a threat to social stability. This is where disability culture and monster theory overlap. Neither of us are supposed to mate, to make more of ourselves. Still, there are people, here we go, there he is. Uh, there are people, mostly men, known as devotees, who have sexual fetishes for women with amputated limbs and other impairments and pursue them with vigor. If one desires the disabled body, it's seen as a paraphilia. When curator Mark Pascal, le voila, asked me, thank you, Mark, asked me to write on Ramberg, it was because my field is disability culture, and Ramberg's images are replete with bandaging and wounding, where images of the disabled body and the monster merge. In journal entries that were quoted in the 2014 documentary, The Harry Who and Chicago Imagists, Ramberg muses on the beauty she finds in amputated limbs and diseased skin. And by the way, that last, the drawing was uh, one of my partners, and I thought a lot about the beauty of um, prosthetics. Um, and in the lovingly precise way that these parts are depicted in her collection of medical reference books. Quote, organs painted so smoothly, caressedly, she says, she, she says that her paintings could be, quote, a little bit pornographic, hands feeling, caressing, masturbating the body, end quote. She mentions, quote, shiny undergarments and wonders, quote, how about implications of rape? So in the 60s, my mother used to get Fredericks of Hollywood catalogs in the mail. I remember those things vividly. And uh, Ramberg had scrapbooks full of those pages, lots of advice about how to drive your man crazy, pre-Cosmo. Naughty lingerie allows a woman to feel being wanted. It can be a signage of her own lust a paradoxical structure that forces, that frees her rather to be amorous. But again, not so simple. Ramberg disrupts the seamless doll of porno fantasy. The armpit hair in this one, the dress shields, if you don't know what those are, uh, in the 50s, um, you would have these kind of shields that were sewn into your dress so that your, you wouldn't have pit stains on your cocktail dress. Um, and, you know, she's got them wearing them as part of the lingerie. It's, it's just so... Uh, Ramberg. <laughs> it's been a nine-month love affair, I'll tell you. Um, they, these things are sly reminders that women's bodies are real, that they sweat, and that they're hairy. Now, the weird thing is that she won't tell us if these women are enacting their own pleasure, or, for instance, if the invading finger in probe cinch belongs to someone else. Again, strange positioning. Nothing that I've ever read on Ramberg remarks on the fact that it's never a male hand touching these eroticized female bodies. Not that I've seen, anyway. Waiting Lady, that we saw, I think, a little while ago, had her arms pulled high out of sight in an s and bondage position. And can we tell if she's performing or if she's being coerced? The red fingernail in false bloom points right at the clitoris. The hands in Ramberg's erotic images never grasp. They tap and tickle and graze, and remain firmly in the realms of ambivalent interpretation. This next part is headed penises and says, use pointer. Uh, <laughs> um, <sighs> bad to the bone. Um, our everyday society asks us to monitor our personal boundaries, right? It's getting in an elevator. Long before COVID, we had social distance just fine. Sexuality, though, demands that we lower those defenses, and with that comes the potential for body horror. Our skin merges 
we are inside each other's bodies. In Ramberg's next series, I see the desire to merge and the dread of dissolving. The engorged Rapunzel towers of brunette sleeves one and two and tall tickler and taller tickler are the very strangest of penises. Clad in lacy netting, decorated with, let's see, can we find it? Sperm, more or less, lots of little spermatozoa. Um, <clears throat> and bound in gleaming swatches of hair. <clears throat> the libido is entrapped in its own soft chains. Female and male genitalia are strapped together in these ropes of hair. You sort of see, let's see, go back one for just a moment uh, to the other penises. Oh no, maybe these are, okay, never mind. Uh, next penises, please. Uh, we, we've lost our penises, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> um, but in uh, Taller Tickler, are we there? Yep. Check this out. Can you guys see this? So penis heading towards woman open legs inside this kind of totally... Uh, I don't know if the word is frozen, but um, uh, it's almost like an eternal moment, you know, of imminence right before something happens. So is it about frustration? Is it about ambivalence? Um, all these things inside desire. And each one of those is a collision of genders. And <clears throat> which really, really sets us up for the next work. Ramberg had a restless mind and an incrementally paced method for developing injury. You got Im imagery. Sometimes I wonder about Im injury. I mean, it's tiny drawing after tiny drawing. Um, blessing on those wrists, man. You have to see her sketchbook pages in the show. I mean, really look at how she thought about an image and reconsidered it and did every variation you can think of before she committed to one of these, you know, astonishing, carefully worked, precise uh, um, paintings. Um, so her shifts can look like wild departures when in fact each builds and circles back over the course of her career. So like the motif of binding and bandaging appears again and again. It flickers between medical dressings, mummification linens, and teenage beachwear. Here in Troubled Sleeve, hair beasts escape from the bandages and from inside the mesh cladding of Istrian River Lady. Hair is still, so previously hair was binding, right? Hair were the ropes. Now hair is resisting control, even if the rest of the body is immobilized. The bandage becomes a tease and a question mark, and like lingerie, it makes us wonder what lies beneath. The blunt, amputated arm of troubled sleeve is fettered by bandages, but then sews in the entire body down to the ponytail, as if she is one enormous wound. These bodies bristle with extruded hair, eyelashes, nipples, a snout, and a jaunty penis escaping the bindings. The beauty in... <laughs> That's some of the hair beasts just running for the <laughs> exits. Uh, the beauty industry has always deemed unwanted hair as a catastrophe. Hair is male, hair is animal, and as such must be eradicated. Be it razors, tweezers, depilatory, depilatories, I think I said that right, and possible martyrdom. As far as I'm concerned, Troubled Sleeve and Istrian Ra River Lady are werewolves. They ooze with hair as if under the pull of a full menstrual moon. In a recent review in the Washington Post, Sebastian Smee refers to Ramberg's, quote, frank expressions of interest in bondage. Quote, this is her uh, saying, <clears throat> I began with a rab rather elaborate idea about women in pain, but loving it, she wrote. 
<clears throat> she occasionally expressed shame about her interest in bodies in extremis, including markers of physical abuse, <clears throat> soiled garments, and poses intimating constraint and pain. So again, volition, control, what exactly is going on in these moments? Ran according to Smee, <clears throat> Ramberg was struggling with, quote, the complex fantasies of a young wife's extramarital yearnings, the shame she felt over her attraction to sadomastic, sadomasochistic imagery, and her guilt over denying that. Smee writes, there is in a state, in a sense, that the struggle itself became her real subject. For me, there is sexual guilt, yes, but I also see a larger struggle between submission and domination writ large, between will and surrender, which is also the monster's essential struggle. If monsters want to be in society, they must tame themselves, right? Choose to act out their true chaotic selves or capitulate to social control. Think about what happens to women when they loose the reins on their own libidos. All the words for them are hideous. And here it is, tension galore. These figures seem set to blow apart. Built on rebar, painful with pressure, and hands completely gone. Strung for bambois has been emptied out and penetrated. Wires zigzag through the open space while bandages are stretched to the breaking point. Hair beasts curl into a question mark at the shoulder, a frowning clown mouth at the pubis. This piece just, when I first saw it, like, okay then. These images are squeezed and fractured and furious, sexually engorged, frustrated and frozen. Ramberg's tight mark making has represented surfaces as diverse as wood, hair, skin, metal, fabric, and flesh. The S marks of wires unravel into pubic hair and the sprouting of a hair suit. Hair suit? Can we, can we get a <laughs> hair suit? I should have looked that up before I. You know, these words that you realize you've never heard out loud? until you find yourself trying to say them in a talk. Note to self, don't do that again. Tight-hipped is rant, rampant and neutered, hands missing, abdominal muscles transmuted into an enormous phallus, which slams into its own sternum. Gloved, by contrast, wears an angular bra, has curved blades for hands, and a pubis ending in a long, sharp V. In a smackdown between tight-hipped and gloved, I think we know who wins. That's the thing about Ramberg. Like the best horror movies, her characters are both in extremis and totally absurd, comical as teenagers dressed up for Halloween and harrowing as kabuki actors in a battle scene. And now the figure explodes. Schizophrenic discovery is the debris left in the wake of a tornado. On the right, a hand has snapped off. On the other, there's no arm at all. The leg is a pile of wreckage. The man's business shirt and briefs, shirt and briefs have been shredded into bandages. Whatever blew him apart, it came from the inside, a revelation that ripped apart the schema of the self. Willful excess wears a bandaged blouse and a bra that sloshes like water. The bra empties into a gray uterus below, which funnels into a second hourglass waist, which is also a pair of legs. The uterine shape is echoed throughout the body as if locked into the machinery of birth. And here is the apotheosis of the monsters. These figures are built entirely of boundaries and collisions, agglomerations of gender, of architecture, of organic metal, of anatomy. The inner and the outer body are in confusion, and the flesh has been totally subsumed into garments. Here they are. Clothing signals to others and to ourselves 
who we are, yet clothing lets us hide the facts of our bodies. Ramberg's knowledge of tailoring gave these vestments plausibility, yet the most arresting element that these bodies are birthing other bodies, sometimes birthing themselves. In sedimentary disturbance, let's see, here we go. There is a mirror or a window that hangs in a flesh pink room inside the torso, a flesh, a bet, a self reflection or an escape. Below, a smaller duplicate torso is being extruded from a hidden orifice. The body is expelling itself as a vulva and as a fetus. A small figure dangles. from the wooden feather pubis. Let's see. Sorry about that. I lost my place. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The wooden feather pubis of hearing. A second peak shirt is entering the hollow body in an endless cycle of replication. The pubis of simultaneous emergence is one huge cerulean uterus and a pair of headless twins are diving out of the maternal urn. And here is something really bizarre. I was showing this to my partner, who is a uh, historian of medical his, uh, curator of medical history. And she pointed out that this shape is eerily reminiscent of the anatomical structure of the clitoris. This was not common knowledge in 1981. I know that Ramberg and Hansen collected medical imagery, but in any event, this is just such a showstopper. Black and Blue Jacket is a festival of puns and puzzles. For instance, do the trousers have a red zipper, or are they a pair of women's naked legs with a cesarean scar down the middle? The entire dress forms a dog's face with braid eyes, blue-black nose, fang mouth with lolling tongue, and floppy Sleeve ears. And when you see this thing, I mean, the textures are just superb. This, this passage, I mean, you just can just stand there forever. But like this shirt, and then this shirt, and then like these sort of hall of mirrors that she manages to set up, it's just riveting. But again, you know, for me, this is about the issue of the boundary, things that are in uneasy conjunction with each other, that the, all of those figures, if they moved, they would just fall apart, right? You can't imagine any of those figures doing anything other than being in stasis in that moment. Whenever she moved house, Christina would cover one wall with her collection of dolls, and there's a great installation in the show of these, like, you guys, you are the best. If sex is our loss of boundaries, pregnancy makes separation impossible. These paintings that we just saw with their birth of doll-like figures might touch on an early and traumatic stillbirth that Ramberg experienced, or recall the eventual birth of her son, or are we watching the self being birthed over and over? Christina Ramberg began her final paintings in 1986. With that, the act of painting was transmogrified. At first glance, these works, sometimes called the satellites or the towers, seem to have been done by a stranger. No more small, blended brush strokes. Ramberg chose the rougher, responsive surface of canvas rather than the glassy smoothness of masonite. These pictures swirl with invisible winds. And just for just a moment, I'm going to talk for a second about her paint. When Christina was doing these pieces, I work in acrylics, and I've been trained by Golden Acrylics in uh, upstate New York, so I know something about the history of the material. And when she was working with those paints, they were ugly. The paints themselves were often loaded with calcium carbonate, which took down the vibrancy of the color, but made it so that all the paints were equally matte. Um, and she managed to take this sort of 
uh, nagahideness of the pain and use it. Like I said, her the way that she makes this palette that for me really touches on mystery and a little bit of distance. Um, I mean, that's just another level of brilliance that I, I haven't seen anybody else do with those paints. The towers are monochromatic, save for subtle ochres and blues. They gave me vertigo until I realized that I wasn't supposed to view the picture plane straight on. I was supposed to understand that I was looking down on them from a height. The towers are many things at once, urn, funnel, skeleton, scaffold, gantry, robot, womb. The motif is a vessel, wide at the top and narrowing to a small circular base that resembles a launching pad. The vessels seem poised to blast off. Now, Ramberg may have stepped away from flesh, but sexuality actually remains. The image of a womb penetrated by a shaft gestures for sexuality as exaltation. I kept thinking of Berenini's St. Teresa, where everything, you know, this sort of piercing, except in these, everything extraneous has been burned away. Towers and satellites are machines for communication, yet this very thing seems doomed to fail. The figures thrust upward, yet look, every rocket is topped by lines that prevent takeoff. The desire for connection or freedom is stymied by internal incoherence. And these are not the jarring departures that people have assumed them to be. Ramberg had always been fascinated by structure and schematics, by the industrial photographs of Burned and Hilla Becker. These images have the same portrait presence for me as those long ago severed hands. In 1989, Christina Ramberg was diagnosed with Pick's disease, an early onset version of frontotemporal dementia, also called FTD. The towers were painted a handful of years before her diagnosis. I discussed these paintings with my brother, cl clinical research psychiatrist, Douglas Lair. While no one can say when a condition like PICS activates in the brain, Doug explained that it had likely been present for some time. As a rule, the progression of FTD may lead to frontal lobe disinhibition, which is a loosening of the strictures of one's behavior. The person is often unaware that they are acting in an unusual manner, even though the people around them may feel that they're in the presence of a stranger. And I wonder if the sudden liberation of Christina's brush felt like a for purely formal decision, or if the impulses that arose from Picks dovetailed with her genius for the radical swerve. Christina Ramberg died in 1995. She was only 49 years old. In the end, we ask, if monsters reveal, then what are the revelations? Ramber's work brings us into the unease of identity within bodily incoherence. I wonder if her experience of being scrutinized sparked this critique of selfhood, because from there, her exploration of female double consciousness led her to cast a skeptical, yet sensual eye on the construction of womanhood. She depicted the conundrum of inappropriate desire. Her language of fracturing and boundaries opened the door to the history of embodiment. She brought body horror, but through the immense wit and playfulness tied to a commitment to beauty. Above all, Christina Ramberg's prodigious gifts formal gifts, give the work their power. She brought an original perspective to the most difficult human truth, that we are and we are not our bodies. In ending, my work is nothing like Christina Ramberg's. I wish, you know, feel very humble in the presence of her work. I make collaborative portraits of people who deal with stigma for reasons that may include disability, sexuality, gender, and other social pressures. We make images together that both embrace and refute the monster. Disability and impairment may factor in the complex process in which an artist develops their practice. It can influence one's imagery, 
preference for materials, and production of work. And this is part of what's meant by disability aesthetic. Disability as an identity only really arose in the late 1970s. It did not exist when Vincent van Gogh, van Gogh, sorry, um, Henri Matisse, Frida Kahlo, or Toulouse Lautrec were in practice. However, aspects of impairment strongly influence each artist's work. Disability aesthetics need not be conscious in order to be influential. Now again, I'm not labeling Ramberg as disabled, but I do see the influence of having an atypical body, of being strikingly tall, and other aspects of her physical history through the arc of her imagery. I consider the possible impact of Pick's disease on her late work, and whether FTD helped open her towards a purified language and achieve those essential forms. This September, I will open a solo show at Zola Lieberman Gallery. For six weeks, I'll perform a public portrait studio in which collaborators will talk to me about their monster selves, and we will draw those monsters together. This project was directly inspired by my deep study of Christina Ramberg's work. I wish I had met you in life, Christina, but I promise I will carry you in me for the rest of my years. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Please raise your hand and a staff member will bring the microphone to you. Is it possible to ring up the house lights a little and dim the spot? Thank you. Oh, there are people here. Who knew? <laughs> I would love to hear what you guys think. Please fling your thoughts my direction. All right, we have a question over here. At what age did you decide to be yourself, just yourself? At what age? In your life, did you decide to be who you are now, to just go your way? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, well, I originally studied at the University of Cincinnati, and I had wanted to try and address um, embodiment uh, as an undergrad there, and I was highly discouraged. And then I came here, and it was somewhat better, but it's still most uh, art world professionals, like gallerists and curators, told me that I would never have a career if I worked on disability or impairment. And then I met a group of radical uh, artists, theorists, um, here in Chicago in 1997 that called themselves the Dis uh, Disabled Artists Collective. And these were some of the founding members of disability culture in America. And they gave me language and um, politics and theory. And I went, oh, <laughs> uh, and I got brave. So that started uh, in the mid 90s. Brave. Er, brave er, anyway. Bravish. <laughs> oh. We, we should. <laughs> huh. <laughs> I'm glad to see you survived that too. <laughs> More questions? There's one over here. Many friends here. Hello. Um, I'm interested, the way that you were kind of arguing or I guess explaining to us about Ramberg's work, um, I think you were kind of framing art for her and also for the other artists that you kind of mentioned um, as sort of a crypt techno um, apparatus. Um, I'm interested in sort of how um, 
artists, especially disabled artists, are using this as sort of a crip device. Uh, can you speak a little bit more on that? I'm trying to follow your question. Um, what is it about crip artists that you would like me to address? Um, the way that she's kind of using art as a crip uh, device in the way that she's addressing like, um, I think you mentioned with the acrylic, uh, the way that she's using it to define um, these more, um, these elements of disability in her work, uh, even if it's not figural. Um, you also mentioned a couple of works that um, deal with like bodily restriction and that maybe, you know, uh, perhaps like a social response to these singular sort of embodiments that are being restricted um, as the sort of um, elite, um, the, the model and uh, in the sort of embodiment sphere. So I'm interested in what you may have to say and like how she's using art as like a crypt device. Um, well, again, you know, I'm not trying to label her as, I'm seeing things in the work that resonate for me. I don't think she would have had anything like a, um, a, a crip identity um, for herself. I, if someone is here who's a close friend or who has a close friend of hers, they may be able to speak to that. But I think that she, I think that, um, You know, when you're dealing with um, difficult embodiment, um, it's not interesting to only be in one place with it. Like, oh, it's so terribly hard to have a body, or I'm going to ignore uh, this, the difficulty struggles. The interesting place is right in between there. And, um, and like I said, I never met her, so I'm hesitant to ascribe uh, motives exactly. I'm trying, I was trying to say, these are the things I see in the work. I'm not saying that these were her motives per se, if that makes sense. Um, I certainly think that the imagists um, as a whole had this interest in monstrosity and grotesque. And some of that was a uh, social co uh, commentary about the times. Some of it was pushing against the New York schools and trying to come up with lexicons of their own that were sort of uniquely located here. Um, for me, she is the most mysterious of them uh, because you think you know what you're looking at. Some of the other images, the, the images are much more sort of uh, agglomerations that, um, how do I put it, seem much more personal. With Ramberg, everything's out there and the forms are very clear. And yet, the longer you look at them, the more sort of complex they become because you see things starting to rise out, like those tall ticklers, I could look at those forever. I see a woman's head, I see all these different, you know, forms inside them. And they're both like sort of in communion, but also entrapped. Or are they entrapped? Is, it, is lust binding them together? Or is it something about lack of choice? And the brilliance for me of the way that she addresses embodiment is that, you know, it's the duck, what is it, the duck rabbit thing? You know, you see this, you see the duck, you see the rabbit, you see the duck, you see the rabbit. For all I know, I, there were ducks and rabbits in there. I didn't spend enough time looking. So, I mean, in terms of crip aesthetic, I find it very strongly in her, but I think it's not something that she was consciously aiming for, if that, if that makes sense. You know, it, it's the best I can do to answer that, your question, I think. Um, more questions, please? We are actually at time. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, thanks Reba. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>